Today, as we think about folks who need our prayers, I'm going to mention a few, and there may be somebody that you want to uh, add to it. And uh, I'm going to ask those who are over in the social hall, if you have somebody to put on the prayer list, uh, put up for our prayer today, if you'll come to the door by the piano, uh, we'll be able to, to get your request. But I'd like to ask you to remember Bubba Morgan. Bubba is, is and Miss Pat uh, are having, well, Miss Pat's having a pretty tough time, and she needs our prayers, and so does Bubba as well. I want us to pray for the Thompson family. We know that, uh, that, that, that the Thompson family has uh, COVID within it because Jimmy and uh, Junior, tell me his first name, Grady, Grady uh, have the COVID, and they need, uh, they need our prayers. But that's COVID in, uh, in Jimmy's family scared the living daylights out of them because Faye, his wife is in the process of cancer treatment, and she's very vulnerable to it. Let me tell you what I got. I called right during Sunday school just a few minutes ago, and uh, believe it or not, I answered it, Stacy, um, and I was civil about it. <laughs> but, uh, but Wendy called, and she said, Miss Faye just called me, and she is not, she is negative. Her test came back negative, and she said, to God be the glory, and I think that's the truth. That's what we need to have, so that's a, uh, something to thank the Lord for, and uh, Carter is in the process of getting his hand all fixed up, so we want to be praying for them. Uh, I saw Richard Shiver yesterday, and he said that his daddy needs our prayers very much. Cole Shiver, C-O-Y-L-E, Cole Shiver. He needs our prayers. He's uh, going into the final stages of dementia, and it's tough. It's tough. Uh, we also want to remember the Roberts family. They've been going through a lot of trouble, too. Uh, Don and Linda, uh, Shirley, and also Stacy, uh, all with different kinds of, of things that they're, they're dealing with, but I hope you'll be remembering them. And then Glow Cabin, this is, uh, has had her... Uh, surgery and uh, I think is doing well pretty well John and Edna Wilkes are not able to be here uh, John needs our prayers and Sarah Tyson who's uh, far off kin to not very far off but it's kin to Randall uh, Sarah had to have her uh, leg removed up to the uh, up to the knee uh, diabetic purposes and that that necessitated that and we need to be uh, praying for her now there's somebody else I'm supposed to put on here and I don't know who Steve, Steve that's who it was Steve uh, Saunders uh, called me last night and he said that uh, he's had two days of 102 temperature doesn't know exactly what the situation is yet he knows that it's not flu he's been tested for that and it's not something else and he's been tested for that but the COVID test comes in a little bit later. So their family, if you'll notice, is not here. That takes out a big chunk from our congregation. Um, and he is our newly elected, uh, uh, one of our newly elected deacons. And so we uh, want to be sure to pray for Steve and his family so that we can find out what, the, what is going on with them. Do you have any other people to add now? The praise, okay. Okay, good. I'm glad. Okay, Mike Dow. ALS, terrible neurological problem, terrible, that they can't do anything with. It strikes the muscles, and those muscles control breathing and the heartbeat. 
and it's just a ter just a terrible thing to have to deal with. Okay, well, let's bow our heads then for prayer time, and uh, uh, Jeffrey is 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 uh, here to do that praying for us. And as soon as he finishes with that, he has something else that he wants to do. October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and normally we have a at least some kind of little eat and get together. Um, but the the COVID has kind of put us a, put it that a, a hold on that for a little while anyway. And we do promise it's going to be for a little while because we're going to start back doing that at some point. But the church just really wants our pastor and his wife to know that we appreciate them and and all that they do. And we have just a little token for that. Here's a song that's going to be played for you that the theme of it is the theme of the sermon that I'm going to be uh, preaching in just a few moments. Thank you, ma'am. I want to invite your attention to Acts, the 12th chapter, verses 20 through 23. This is a little bitty story that fits inside a larger story, but I want to read it to you because of what it says about uh, King Herod. I may just start back up with uh, verse 19 instead of verse 20 so you can get the part of the story that fits in it. <clears throat> Peter had just been locked up in, in jail, and the angel of God came and opened the jail up for him, shook off all the, all the bonds that he had with an earthquake, and, uh, and then Peter had left 
the, the jail. And in the process of, of leaving, uh, he goes to the place where the church is meeting, and, uh, and then he goes back into hiding. And in verse 19, you see Herod's reaction to him. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon, two cities on the, go on the, on the coast, the Mediterranean coast. But they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus the king's chamberlain their friend, desired peace, because their country was nourished by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms, and he gave up the ghost. This is a little intriguing story that Luke inserts in the larger story of uh, Peter's imprisonment and the result of Peter's escape. This story is validated for us not just by the fact that it's in Scripture, but by the fact that Josephus, who was a Jewish historian of, Roman, of the Roman Empire, uh, also, told, also told it. There's a lot of difference between what, ha what is told by Josephus and what is told by Luke. For instance, according to Josephus, Tyre and Sidon had angered Herod Agrippa. And in meeting with him, the cities saw Agrippa at dawn coming to get them dressed in a suit of silver cloth. And the rays of the sun shone so brightly on it in such a way as to produce a brilliant effect as he came to where they were. They cried out, Hitherto we have, un we have reverenced you as a man, but henceforth we acknowledge thee to be more of more than mortal nature because of the shining that they saw. Josephus then says that Agrippa gave tacit approval to the glory they ascribed to him. And he said that he looked up, Josephus said that Agrippa looked up and saw an owl. And when Agrippa had been thrown in jail some years before by the emperor Tiberius, he saw an owl as he leaned against a tree. A fellow prisoner told him that it was a good omen on which, and, uh, on, because uh, the next time he saw, but the next time he saw an owl, that he would die within five days. The first owl he saw, according to Josephus, was a good omen that he was going to be all right and be elevated. The second owl he saw meant that he was going to die in five days. And sure enough, in five days, he died a painful and horrible death. Josephus doesn't tell us how he died. Luke, the doctor, tells us how he died. Immediately, the angel of the Lord smote him. Because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. I don't know whether you have... You grew up in the days that I did. Whenever I saw uh, screw worms in hogs and cows, I can't imagine that in a human being. But I can imagine the pain that must go with it. In the early church, the people had to learn catechisms. Because that's the way they learned 
what the church was about and what the scripture says. And it says the question that was asked was, what is the chief end of man? And the answer, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says this. Listen carefully. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now glory is one of those terms that we use within the church. And those terms are abstract and we have a hard time with them. Today I want to use this story as the basis of the word glory in which, in which Luke says, <clears throat> and immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. Because he gave not God the glory. Now what does the word mean? The, re the Greek word for uh, glory is translated to glorify and it appears 58 times in the New Testament. The chief, he said, and it means to magnify, to honor, to laud, to exalt or exalt. And the English word that we use, glorify, means to make larger, it means to be better, and it means to be more beautiful. So to glorify God makes God look better in the eyes of the world. If you want to glorify God, you do so so that the world will see God in a better light. And I'm going to tell you if there's anything our world, especially the United States, needs right now, it is to glorify God in a better light, to see God as something better than anything else in the world. Why doesn't the world see it? Maybe it's because we don't glorify God. We glorify his church. We glorify some preachers. But do we glorify God? That's the point. We must make him look better to those around us. Well, you may say, why glorify God then? I think because he made us. In Romans 1, 11, 36, he says, Paul says, For from him and through him and to him all, all, are all things. To him be the glory forever. He brought us into being. He gave us all that we, that we have here. So why shouldn't we glorify him? Because and also because <clears throat> He redeemed us. Ephesians 3 says this. Now to him who is able to exceedingly uh, beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory. To God be the glory. We should glorify God because he judges those who refuse to glorify him according to the text that, he, that I just read to you. Listen to it. He gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Now, I want to give you a list of about seven things. And if you have a pencil and paper, you might want to write these down about glorifying God. How do we do it? How do we come to the point of glorifying God so that he gets from us what he desires and what he deserves well there's there are several there are several suggestions from scripture first of all we glorify God by acknowledging his son as our Lord we have to do that that must be done Paul said in Philippians the second chapter and the tenth verse every tongue shall confess Fess the Lord Jesus, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
every tongue shall do that. That's going to be done in judgment. But it's also going to be done on this earth. We must admit that God's, that Jesus is God's son. And when we do that, we bring glory to the Father. When we do that, we're saved. The Bible says you can't confess that Jesus is Lord except as the Holy Spirit leads you to do that. So if you can say it, then you can be saved. And you must, therefore, glorify God in it. We glorify God secondly by obeying His commandments. I want you to listen to 2 Corinthians 9, 13. They will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ. To your, according to your profession, confession of the gospel of Christ. There was a sign once, once that was put on, a, on our, one of our national highways. And the sign said, speed limit, 55 miles per hour. And somebody came along and wrote under it. Those obeying, move to the right and don't block traffic. If you've ever been on, a, on say, 85, 75, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You get in those two middle lanes and you go 75 miles an hour, they're going to come around you and blow their horn at you and point to the right lane. They're going to do that in spite of everything. Now, aren't we like that? with the laws of God? Don't we sometimes think that the law of God is for somebody else other than for us? If they show us up or cramp our style, we simply ignore what God has told us to do. We want to be free from rules. Folks, when you're dealing with God, God is full of rules. He calls them in the Bible the Ten Commandments. He calls them in the Bible, the Sermon on the Mount. It's full of rules. And if we want to glorify God, we're going to live by the rules that he has given to us. That's what we're going to do. A third way we glorify God is by doing good works. Listen to Matthew 5 out of the Sermon on the Mount. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works then what follows? And glorify your Father which is in heaven. You want people to see the good works that you do. You want them to see that you are doing it in the name of Jesus Christ. So that God can get the glory for it. Not us, but for God. Now Jesus went on in the Sermon on the Mount. To talk about where we pray. Get in your closet, he said. Don't bring, don't bring it to yourself. Don't bring the attention to yourself. Get in your closet and do your praying. What did he say about giving? Don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. In other words, you don't do it so people will see it. You do it. You do it. And that way, we glorify God. We must glorify God as Christians, and we do so, and when we do so, God becomes glorified because of what we do. There's a fourth thing. We glorify God by keeping ourselves pure. Isaiah, I mean, 1 Corinthians 6, chapter 20th verse says this, For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. No matter what our sex-saturated society suggests, we must, when we misuse our bodies, we are dishonoring the Almighty who made us. I want you to understand what I am saying. We are living in a sex-saturated society that anything goes. I was just reading in World Magazine last night about people who who are so uh, put off with a traditional way of marriage that they are beginning 
even Christian young'uns are beginning to cohabit before they are married. Even Christian young'uns. And then when something happens and a little thing begins to grow within the stomach, they come to the preacher, preacher, help us. Preacher, we need to get married. That's something you do first. And then comes family. And then. That's the ideal. That's what God wants us to do. We who are Christians, if we want to glorify God, that's what we will do. We will wait until we are married to have our children now, there's something else that I have to say. And that is that there are too many people in the world who are like Jimmy, Jimmy Voles. They're in danger of COVID because their belly is too big. Because there's more fat in the system than ought to be there. My fatness, even though the word glorify means to make bigger, my fatness is not, does not glorify God. All of us must recognize that we give God glory within our body. We go, sometimes we don't go far enough in this matter of personal purity. There was one man at church who prayed continuously. Every time the pastor called on him, he said, Oh, Lord, clean the cobwebs out of my life. And that sounds good, doesn't it? Well, there's a little girl, who, young girl who heard it. And she, as soon as he said amen, began to pray, Lord, clean those cobwebs out of his life and kill the spider that's making them. Now, you think about that just a moment. Isn't that what we do with our act actions? We want God to clean them away with our, out of our lives, but we don't want him to stop us from making those cobwebs that ought not to be there. It's not enough just to confess our sins. We must quit going to the places, stop hanging around with the people, and cease filling our minds with the garbage that leads us to sin. We've got to, got to consider that if we glorify God. Fifth, we glorify God by offering praise to him. Now, I love this, and I love to do that. In Psalm 50, verse 23, it says, Whosoever offereth praise glorifieth me. When we gather with other Christians in worship, and when we sing a song of joyful, with a joyful voice, and when we count our many blessings in testimonies that are given, when we offer our praise to him, we glorify God. That's one of the ways that we find God being glorified inside of us, by giving liberally at the praise that needs to come to him. But then there's another one, number six. We glorify God by giving liberally to his cause. Now, preacher, you didn't need to put in this business about giving. Well, if we're going to glorify God, we have to do that. Listen to 2 Corinthians 9, 13. They will glorify God for the liberality of their contribution to them and to all. When you give in this way, it's not so the pastor will be magnified. It's not so that the church will be magnified. It is so that God will be magnified. You give because God wants you to give and bless his name in doing so. And then there's number seven. We glorify God by leading other people to be saved. There's a story in that here in this story where Peter or in the book of Acts, rather, where Peter and Cornelius, who is a Roman centurion, that is saved. And Peter doesn't think anybody outside of the Jews can be saved. So God opens Peter's eyes 
he sends Peter to Cornelius' house. He sends Peter because Peter, Peter saw three times that he, when he was hungry, he had a vision three times on the rooftop where, where there came down a big sheet. And in that sheet was all, in that sheet was all kind of, of, uh, fi of physically unclean animals. And the, God, the Lord said, Peter, rise, kill, and eat. And Peter said, Lord, you know none of that stuff has ever been through my mouth. I've never tasted any of that. I'm a pure Jew. Three times he heard that. And at the end of the third time when he said, Lord, I can't do that. I've never, I've never been able to, to eat unclean food. A knock came at the door of his house. And that knock was from soldiers that Cornelius had sent to tell Peter to come. There were things he wanted to find out. And so Peter came because he finally realized that that sheet was talking about people who are in that sheet and you need to accept them you need to accept them so he goes to peter's house uh, to cornelius's house and there he sees the holy ghost come upon the, those soldiers as they receive the gospel of jesus christ into their lives but listen to what the the final words are and when they had heard this, they quieted down, and they glorified God, saying, Well, then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. And he glorified God by being saved and by being led to God. And then the last one, number eight. We glorify God by living in unity with one another. That's what he says in Romans. Listen to the words. Now, Romans 15, Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Jesus Christ, that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we come together in worship at this church or any church, our object should be to glorify God, not to soothe our consciences, not to soothe our being, but to glorify God. That's the reason that we come together. And we do that through unity, folks. That's why fellowship is so important in the church. Why, that's why we recognize each other as brother and sister. I, I, I have, I have a, a, a real fondness when the kids that I read to come up to me in a grocery store or on a street corner or anywhere I meet them and they say, that's Brother Jimmy. To their mama. That's Brother Jimmy. I love that term because it says I am their brother. <laughs> I love it. And because it gives God glory for who I am. And that's why we recognize each other as brother and sister around here. I love that song, don't you? As we move forward in unity and purpose. We glorify God. Now I realize that I have spoken to you about a, ver a, a word that is abstract. When you think of glory, I don't know what you think about. I don't know whether you think about a great light or you think about something big or if you think about something strong or if you think, I don't know what you think about when you see the word glory. But I know here are six, here are eight things that God gets glory from us through and I think it might be a, that we ought to look at that when we come to church that we're coming not to glorify a preacher not to glorify a song fest we come to glorify God and that's the reason we're here in church
Would you bow your heads with me, please? Our Father, we glorify your name today because of who you are. We glorify your name because of what we need within our hearts, and that is to recognize that you belong to all of us through our Lord Jesus Christ. You've given to us an older brother that can lead us because he's been through it all. He can help us because he knows the route and the way. I thank you, Lord, for Jesus. I thank you that you loved us enough to send him to die for our sins. I thank you and I glorify your name because of the times when we come together, we can say to God be the glory. Great things he hath done. He has done so much for us. You have done so much for us. And we're grateful. And now we pray that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit will go with us.